Why Revival Terries by Leonard Ravenhill Chapter 6 The Epigraphs Power from on high is the supreme need of today. Charles G. Finney If Christ waited to be anointed before he went to preach, no young man ought to preach until he too has been anointed by the Holy Ghost. F. B. Meyer Beware of reasoning about God's word. Obey it. Oswald Chambers I cannot work my soul to save, for that my Lord hath done. But I will work like any slave, for love of God's dear Son. Unknown Tell me in the light of the cross, isn't it a scandal that you and I live today as we do? Alan Redpath As soon as we cease to bleed, we cease to bless. Dr. J. H. Jowett Why Revival Terries, Chapter 6 Revival Terries, Because Harnick defined Christianity as a very simple but very sublime thing. To live in time and for eternity, under the eye of God and by His help. Oh, that believers would become eternity conscious! If we could live every moment of every day under the eye of God, if we did every act in the light of the judgment seat, if we sold every article in the light of the judgment seat, if we prayed every prayer in the light of the judgment seat, if we tithed all our possessions in the light of the judgment seat, if we preachers prepared every sermon with one eye on damned humanity and the other on the judgment seat, then we would have a Holy Ghost revival that would shake this earth and that, in no time at all, would liberate millions of precious souls. The heady, high-minded, incontinent truce-breakers of this hour, the tottering thrones, the smoldering fires of communism, and the bid for world dominion that Rome makes, should fill us with alarm. It has been well said that there are only three classes of people in the world today. Those who are afraid, those who do not know enough to be afraid, and those who know their Bibles. Sodom, which had no Bible, no preachers, no tracts, no prayer meetings, no churches, perished. How then will America and England be spared from the wrath of the Almighty, think you? We have millions of Bibles, scores of thousands of churches, endless preachers, and yet, what sin? Men build our churches, but do not enter them. Print our Bibles, but do not read them. Talk about God, but do not believe Him. Speak of Christ, but do not trust Him for salvation. Sing our hymns, and then forget them. How are we going to come out of all of this? Almost every Bible conference majors on today's church being like the Ephesian church. We are told that, despite our sin and carnality, we are seated with him. Alas, what a lie! We are Ephesians, all right, but as the Ephesian church in Revelation, we have left our first love. We appease sin, but do not oppose it. To such a cold, carnal, critical, care cowed church, this lax, loose, lustful, licentious age will never capitulate. Let us stop looking for scapegoats. The fault in declining morality is not radio or television. The whole blame for the present international degeneration and corruption lies at the door of the church. It is no longer a thorn in the sight of the world. Yet, it has not been in times of popularity, but of adversity, that the true church has always triumphed. It is passing strange that we are so simple as to believe that the church is presenting to men the New Testament standard of Jesus by such a substandard of Christian living. Why does revival tarry? The answer is simple enough. Because evangelism is so highly commercialized. The tithes of widows and of the poor are spent in luxury living by many evangelists. The great crowds, great lines of seekers, great appreciation by the mayor, etc. are shouted to high heaven. All get publicity, except the love offering. The poor dupes who give think they do God's service, 
while all they are doing is keeping a big reputation, small-hearted preacher living in Hollywood style. Preachers who have homes and cottages by the lake, a boat on that lake, and a big bank balance still beg for more. With such extortioners and unjust men, can God entrust Holy Ghost revival? These dear doll-like preacher boys no longer change their suits once a day, but two or three times a day. They preach the Jesus of the stable, but themselves live in swank hotels. For their own lust, they bleed the audience financially in the name of the one who had to borrow a penny to illustrate his sermon. They wear expensive Hollywood suits in honor of the one who wore a peasant's robe. They feast on $3 steaks in remembrance of the one who fasted alone in the desert. Today, an evangelist is not only worthy of his hire, so he thinks, but of compound interest. How fearful will all this be in the judgment morning. Revival tarries because of the cheapening of the gospel. We now have church hymns played strictly to dance tempo on our sacred records and over the radio, as well as in the churches. We have the precious blood of Jesus set to boogie-woogie time. Imagine, we have the Holy Ghost syncopated. The platform has become a shop window to display our gifts, and the visiting team look like a mannequin parade. I would as soon expect a frog to sit down and play Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata as expect to see some of the slick preachers of this hour preach with an anointing that would cause godly fear among the people. The evangelists today are very often prepared to be anything to anybody as long as they can get somebody to the altar for something. They glibly call out, Who wants help? Who wants more power? Who wants a closer walk with God? Such a sinning, repenting, easy believism dishonors the blood and prostitutes the altar. We must alter the altar, for the altar is a place to die on. Let those who will not pay this price leave it alone. Revival tarries because of carelessness. At the altar, too little time is spent with those souls who come to do eternal business. The evangelist is happy seeing his friends, and while sinners groan at the altar, he is drinking in the rich cream of men's praises. Thus, America and England are strewn with spiritual derelicts, confused and confounded. Revival tarries because of fear. As evangelists, we are tight-lipped about the spurious religions of the day, as if there were more than one name whereby men must be saved. But Acts 4.12 is still in the scriptures. There is none other name under heaven. To the modern preacher, does this seem tinged with bigotry? Elijah mocked the prophets of Baal and sneered with derisive scorn at their impotence. Better to run out in the dark as Gideon did and cut down groves to false gods than fail to do the will of God. The Christless cults and deity dishonoring mushroom religions of this midnight hour tempt the Lord God. Will no one sound the alarm? We are not Protestants anymore, just non-Catholics. Of what and of whom do we protest? Were we half as hot as we think we are and a tenth as powerful as we say we are, our Christians would be baptized in blood as well as in water and in fire. Wesley saw the doors of the English churches closed against him, and Roland Hill says of him, He and his lay lubbers, his ragged legion of preaching tinkers, scavengers, draymen, and chimney sweepers, etc., go forth to poison the minds of men. What scurrilous language! But Wesley feared neither men nor devils. If Whitfield was burlesqued on the English stage in the basest way, and if in the New Testament Christians were stoned and suffered every ignominy, how is it then, since sin and sinners have not changed, that we preachers no longer raise the wrath of hell? Why are we so icily regular, so splendidly null? We can have riots without revival, but in the light of the Bible and church history, where can we have revival without riots? Revival tarries because we lack urgency in prayer. A famed preacher entered a conference the other day with these words, 
I have come to this conference with a great burden for prayer on my heart. Will those who will share this with me please raise their hands and let none of us be hypocrites? There was a good response. But later in the week, when a half night of prayer was called, the big preacher went to bed. Not much of a hypocrite. Integrity has passed away. All is superficial. The biggest single factor contributing to delayed Holy Ghost revival is this omission of soul travail. We are substituting propaganda for propagation. How insane! The New Testament adds a valuable postscript concerning Elijah when James 5.17 says, He prayed. Had it not been for that, we should have seized the Old Testament story and noting the omission of prayer, have said, Elijah prophesied. We have not yet resisted unto blood and prayer. Nay, we do not even get a sweat on our souls, as Luther put it. We pray with a take-it-or-leave-it attitude. We pray chance prayers. We offer that which costs us nothing. We have not even strong desire. We rather are fitful, moody, and spasmodic. The only power that God yields to is that of prayer. We will write about prayer power, but not fight while in prayer. A title undeniably true of the church today would be, We Wrestle Not. We will display our gifts, natural or spiritual. We will air our views, political or spiritual. We will preach a sermon or write a book to correct a brother in doctrine. But who will storm hell's stronghold? Who will say the devil nay? Who will deny himself good food or good company or good rest that hell may gaze upon him wrestling, embarrassing demons, liberating captives, depopulating hell and leaving in answer to his travail a stream of blood-washed souls? Finally, revival tarries because we steal the glory that belongs to God. Listen to this in wonder. Jesus said, I receive not honor from men, and how can ye believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Away with all fleshly backslapping and platform flattery. Away with this exalting of my radio program, my church, my books. Oh, the sickening parade of flesh in our pulpits. We are greatly privileged, etc., Speakers who are there really by grace alone accept all this, nay, even expect it. The fact is that when we have listened to most of these men, we would not have known they were great if they had not been announced so. Poor God! He does not get much out of it all. Then why doesn't God fulfill His blessed and yet awful promise and spew us out of His mouth? We have failed. We are filthy. We love men's praise. We seek our own. O God, lift us out of this rut and this rot. Bless us with breakings. Judgment must begin with us preachers.